like to say hello? Would you like to say hello? I thought we would invade your catio. Oh, you see my coffee and you're interested in it, aren't you? I thought we would invade your catio to start my November reading vlog. It's such a rainy, cozy, November-y kind of day and the sound of the rain is so pretty out here. So I had a lovely October reading month, the one book that I didn't get to, um, but I mentioned I was hoping to start on Halloween because it was one of my Butu um, reads. My spookiest one was The Mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe. This is mentioned in Northanger Abbey, Anne Radcliffe, um, the author, was wrote gothic horror tales in the Regency period, and Jane Austen was kind of spoofing that genre in Northanger Abbey. But obviously she also really enjoyed Anne Radcliffe as an author. I've never read Anne Radcliffe before. She's always been on my list, and I thought it'd be a fun Haunted Mansion kind of spooky book for Halloween. I wish, I'd, I wish now that I'd started it earlier, because it was definitely a slow start. I did read a fair bit on, on Halloween weekend. Emily, the heroine, is from the St. Aubert family and she lives with her mother and father up in this like incredibly gorgeous portion of the Pyrenees and like the scenery is just spectacular and everything is so idyllic but it's clear that everything is about to go downhill. This is the beginning of the book but it is a little spoilery so if you don't want any spoilers go and um, you should probably skip ahead, there's your warning. But yeah, first of all, her mother passes away, which is very sad. And then her father also gets sick, and it's clear that he's probably not gonna make it much longer. But they go on this trip to try to find some like better air for him to you know, hopefully recover his health a little bit. Hello! And there are these long, long descriptions of their journey and all the scenery that they're passing through. I was thinking it's no wonder in Northanger Abbey that Catherine Moreland, she says that part of Bath um, reminds her of the, the Pyrenees. And, and Mr. Tilney is kind of surprised. He's like, oh, you've been outside of England? And she was like, no, I'm just, no, it just reminds me of how Anne Radcliffe wrote. <laughs> The descriptions are so, so long. There was one I highlighted because it made me laugh that it was like her describing the cows in the field. I mean, here's one lovely description. The dawn, which softened the scenery with its peculiar gray tint, now dispersed, and Emily watched the progress of the day, first trembling on the tops of the highest cliffs, then touching them with splendid light, while their sides in the veil below were still wrapped in dewy mist. I mean, that's lovely, but when it goes on and on and on for page after page after page at that end, you become a little weird of it. While they're on this pleasure excursion, they meet a young man named Valancourt, and he is definitely sort of the type you imagine Marianne is waiting for <laughs> in Sense and Sensibility. When he walks along with Emily, he frequently fixed his eyes pensively on her countenance, which expressed with so much animation the taste and energy of her mind. And when he spoke again, there was a peculiar tenderness in the tone of his voice that defeated any attempt to conceal his sentiments. Valancourt is a bit much. I already gave a spoiler warning, but at one point, you know, they part ways. Valancourt is just Valancourt is just on holiday enjoying these mountain scenes and they're headed towards the coast. And, you know, it's gotten dark and they haven't reached their hotel yet. Really, their travel planning is absolutely abysmal and they're afraid of basically robbers along the road. Hello? Yeah, you're attacking my hand, aren't you? <laughs> um so they're afraid of meeting robbers along the road and they see a horseman following them and so Emily's father is like all ready he gets his gun out and he shoots and it turns out it was Valancourt coming to join them again and Emily faints Emily's constantly fainting away but he's fine he recovers and to be honest that whole part of the story kind of drags but then they end up just randomly at this chateau and Saint Aubert, Emily's father, it seems like he knew the owners at one point but it's abandoned and the peasants have all these like superstitions and don't want to go near it at night. Emily's father, who obviously has not been doing well, does at that point pass away but before he dies he gives her this mysterious injunction to find these hidden papers in his office and burn them without looking at them. At the beginning of the story, we heard how St. Aubert really values his retirement and values the simple things in life and really has a very poor opinion of like Paris and high society. In fact, he likes Valancourt because he says, clearly this young man has never been to Paris, like multiple times. I feel like they should put that on a t-shirt for Mysteries of Udolpho fans. Yeah, I still have no idea who Udolpho is, so that's still a mystery. Oh honey, you know you don't, you don't fight with my leg, you know that. However, it's beginning to become clear that Emily's father 
did know Paris as a young man. And so maybe there's something mysterious in his past. But I, I'm just at the point where she's gotten home. And she didn't go and, and get the papers. I mean, I would have I would have gone and burnt them straight away so that I wouldn't be tempted to look at them. Because otherwise, all I would be thinking about was, Honey, why are you doing that? Obviously, in the Regency time period, there was no TV. There was no internet. So, you know, oh. And the novel, reading the novel, was meant to kill time, and so I think it was meant to be long descriptive passages um, that took you a long time to read, but of course today it's like, you know, you, you could have edited that out. The writing is good though. I feel like you can see kind of traces of Jane Austen or things that Jane Austen must have loved. At one point, Emily's father does caution her against really the theme of sense and sensibility being too sensible um, and too emotional. All excess is vicious. Even that sorrow, which is amiable in its origin, becomes a selfish and unjust passion if indulged at the expense of our duties. By our duties, I mean what we owe to ourselves as well as to others. We, c we become the victim of our feelings unless we can in some degree command them. Although it's clear that Emily, at this point, definitely cannot command her feelings. <laughs> Here's another pithy aphorism from St. Aubert. Virtue and taste are nearly the same, for virtue is little more than active taste. Here's how St. Aubert um, educated Emily. He cultivated her understanding with the most scrupulous care. He gave her a general view of the sciences and an exact acquaintance with every part of elegant literature. Doesn't it sound like how um, Miss Bigley is trying to describe the accomplished woman to Elizabeth Bennet in Pride and Prejudice? Anyway, the pace of the story has definitely picked up a lot more, so I'm hoping I'll be able to get through it pretty quickly. There's definitely more suspense and like Halloween-y, spooky vibes at this point. Like she goes to visit her father's grave and she wants to go like in the dead of night when there's nowhere else one else around which like yeah that seems like a great idea this part of the story is reminding me a little bit of Dracula because I'm constantly like this is not a good idea or like there's just this sense of foreboding that things are about to go very wrong and like really Emily should be aware of it and like somebody should be you know guarding against it but nobody is yeah she goes to she goes to visit her father's grave in the middle of the night and um and she thinks she sees a shadow in the distance, which is like, that's pretty creepy. But the nun warns her, oh, they just dug a grave today and it's still open, so be careful you don't fall in. <laughs> like, just casually. There's definitely some spooky suspense, but there's also some humor. Like, later, she's back in her father's study and she thinks she sees another shadow moving, like, in her own house, in her own chateau, but then it turns out it's the dog. <laughs> And there's a funny passage where they're, um, he's actually not a carriage driver, he's their mule driver, because I guess they're, um, being, their carriage is being drawn by mules while they're going on this health trip. And the, the mule and the mule driver wants his mules to be able to come and, and sleep in the cottage. Like, they've just basically asked these peasants along the road if they can stay with them and sort of take their best beds, which they're paying for, but still it's so different from today where you know you research your hotel, you book your hotel. Instead, St. Aubert and Emily just, you know, go wandering around the lanes up in the, up in the mountains and hope that they'll find a peasant who's willing to accommodate them. But then their mule driver wants the peasant to accommodate his mules too. And eventually, finally, they, they convinced him that like, look, that's, that's not gonna happen, okay? I bet Jane Austen enjoyed those touches of humor. And I was thinking, I feel like it's the humor in Austen that makes her so timeless. Jane Austen definitely did a better job paring down um, her descriptions uh, than, than Anne Radcliffe. I'm feeling like maybe I'll have to reread Northanger Abbey after I finish um, Mysteries of Udolpho. I have started Letters to a Diminished Church by Dorothy Zayers. I read this for the first time about a year and a half ago and I loved it so much I was realizing looking through that I hadn't actually underlined a whole lot of things and it was because I would have just had to underline the whole chapter. Like her thoughts and reasoning are so beautiful and so keen and incisive and fantastic. So I'm really glad I'm revisiting this. It was definitely one of those works where reading through it there was so much I felt like I know I'm gonna have to read this again soon. Whenever I read Dorothy Sayers's um, Lord Peter Mysteries, I'm always tempted to stop and look up the quotations that she sprinkles in. Um, and so of course she has literary allusions in this as well. She's talking about Christ here. He was emphatically not a dull man in his human lifetime, and if he was God, there can be nothing dull about God either. But he had a daily beauty in his life that made us ugly. That's in quotations. I had to look it up. It is Othello. Isn't that beautiful though? Uh, and the and official them felt that the established order of things would be more secure without him, so they did away with God in the name of peace and quietness. 
Here's one more. That God should play the tyrant over man is a dismal story of unrelieved oppression. That man should play the tyrant over man is the usual dreary record of human futility. But that man should play the tyrant over God and find him a better man than himself is an astonishing drama indeed. Any journalist hearing of it for the first time would recognize it as news. Those who did hear it for the first time actually called it news, and good news at that, though we are likely to forget that the word gospel ever meant anything so sensational. Perhaps the drama is played out now and Jesus is safely dead and buried. Dead and buried, perhaps. It is ironical and entertaining to consider that at least once in the world's history those words might have been spoken with complete conviction, and that was upon the eve of the resurrection. And then the other book that I have here um, that I'm hoping to make some progress in this month is Rilla of Ingleside by Ellen Montgomery. This is the last book, I believe, in the Anne of Green Gables series. It's about um, Anne's youngest child, Rilla. World War World War One is on the horizon, so I'm expecting this to be a little bit more of a sober um, and darker book than the others. In fact, I feel like the other books that I've read have had sort of, you know, sort of uh, foreshadowing to um, to some sorrow and loss in uh, World War I for the family. But I'm sure it will still be full of the fun um, community that surrounds Anne and Gilbert and their lovely family. Cymbeline is enjoying her box over there. <laughs> the first chapter is about a troublesome cat who is named um, Hyde and Jekyll, Jekyll and Hyde, because he has two personalities. Sometimes when there's a storm coming, he turns into a possessed cat, a demon cat, uh, as Cymbeline seems to be feeling some Jekyll and Hyde vibes. Um, and some of the time he's a very sweet cat. I think I said this when I was reading um, the Rainbow Valley earlier this year, another book in the Anne of Green Gables series. Um, and I just feel like Ellen Montgomery must have lived with these characters in her mind. Like she must have kind of gone about the, isn't it Four Winds, the community? Um, and and felt like she knew and felt like she knew them because the way she writes about her characters is so loving and she seems to remember the old characters and what happened to them so well which unfortunately when i sometimes when she brings in past characters i'm like i think these people are from three books back but i can't really remember i like how in these communities everyone knows everyone else and everyone knows everyone else's history and like family history which in some ways can be you know gossipy and frustrating but in other ways like gives you some context into people's characters my grandmother always used to say consider the source so like if you had someone who you knew was not a great person or like was not reliable in some way she is practically levitating the way she was hopping over that. <laughs> Obviously, I should have the camera turned in the opposite direction, huh? But anyway, one of the good things about knowing everyone in your community so well is that you know when they are making a statement that you should listen to and when you're there, and when you just need to kind of recognize that they're having a bad day or like they have a bad history with that and like you don't really need to, you don't really need to pay attention to that one. I feel like with the internet, we've lost that to a very, We've lost that completely because, you know, you, you can't consider the source. Okay, you guys, I obviously need to... Uh, are you going to do your hopping for them? Or are you going to stop hopping now that I've turned the camera on you? The way she was jumping... Yeah, so this is, um... I gave Cymbeline a little box palace. Can't you show them? You were, like, hopping. It was amazing. You just, like, hop right over that. Like this. She's like, yeah, I'll just watch you do it.
I've been collecting and pressing these beautiful leaves. This one is so huge. Isn't it like a mallorn leaf from Lothlorien? Um, I've been just collecting them when I've been out and about this autumn and pressing them, but I haven't yet gotten around to actually like putting them in notebooks. And this one is so huge. I don't even know. I, don't, I think it's bigger than all of my notebooks. I'm going to have to find somewhere special. But what I actually wanted to talk to you about today is Dune. The new film adaptation is finally out. I meant to include a review of it in my October reading blog because actually I watched it last month when it came out. It's been on the HBO streaming service. We only signed up for like a month so we could watch it there. I think it's also in theaters. My brothers and I did a reaction to the trailer ages ago. We're all pretty big fans of Dune in my family. I went in with low expectations, which is what I tend to do for everything these days because you're just less disappointed. The trailer did impress us and I have to say that in this case, I felt like the trailer was a pretty good representation of the movie and I did really enjoy the movie. There were somewhat mixed feelings about it in my house on the whole. I think everybody liked it. One of my brothers said it was everything The Last Jedi should have been. Watching it, I did feel like it was made by someone who understood Dune, who knew the book really well and loved the book and understood what made Dune special and was trying to translate that onto the screen. Um, this movie was actually just part one, so I didn't quite realized that when we went into it, um, that it just book one, that it was not going to be the full first Dune. Let's see, so just the first 325 pages of this tome. When a film adaptation makes me want to go back and reread the book, I feel like it's pretty good. Um, and that is what this film adaptation did. I last reread this maybe two years ago. More recently, I've been working my way through all of the sequels for the first time. So I haven't revisited this super recently, but there were lots of moments in the movie that made me think, I think that's exactly how it unfolded in the book, like just exactly the same way. Dune is obviously a science fiction book. It takes place in a sort of alternate reality, although not really alternate reality. It's like a sort of far vision of the very, very far distant future. And there are all these power players trying to keep control of the galaxy, the Ben Gesserit, it are this order of sort of mysterious nuns who are pulling strings behind the scenes. There's the emperor. There are these powerful houses. The Atreides are one of them. Paul Atreides um, is uh, the son of Duke Leto, and they and House Atreides has just been given control of the planet Dune. There's this mysterious spice that that like enhances your senses and helps you live longer and like enables space travel for the guild. There were so many things in the movie that they really couldn't go into because there's so much lore in Dune. Um, so I feel like when you translate it to film and you're condensing it down into, you know, a three hour time slot or whatever, you know, you're just gonna have to lose some things. But at, on the whole, I felt like they did a really great job with the things they kept, they managed to get in and how they managed to, to convey some of this lore. I loved the Ben. Jezret, the scene with the Gom Jabor, thought that was really powerful. I loved how Jessica, and again, I think this is exactly how it was in the book. She's waiting outside and her son, Paul. Jessica is a member of the Ben Jezret. Paul, the hero, is her, her son. Um, and she's trained him in the Ben Gesserit ways and he's being tested by the Ben Gesserit. And she's waiting outside the room and she's so anxious. And so she says the Ben Gesserit litany against fear, which of course is, fear is the mind killer, fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear, I will, it, I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when the fear has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. It's a great litany. I say it myself sometimes. Because if you're ever making a decision based on fear or you're being pressured into making a decision based on fear, that's not really sound judgment. Like, you want to say the litany against fear and then rethink it. I should probably warn you, this sort of mini review is going to be spoilery, so if you don't want spoilers for the movie or the book, you should skip ahead. I'll mention this for Porthos. Porthos, I know you're watching. Porthos was not, my brother Porthos was not perfectly pleased with this adaptation. Um, and one thing that annoyed him, that annoyed, annoyed me as well, was when Jessica meets one of the um, natives of Dune are called the Fremen. They're very mysterious people. They live out in the middle of the desert. The desert is where they get the, where the spice has to be harvested. It's very dangerous. There are these enormous sandworms that you have to deal with. 
Anyway, the fr Jessica meets a Fremen. Uh, her housekeeper is actually a Fremen. And Jessica kind of has to guess how she's supposed to react because she's sort of fulfilling a prophecy for the Fremen housekeeper. That's one of the things the Ben Gesserit have done. They've gone all around the galaxy and sort of planted these seeds, prepared the way by planting these seeds of lore for their sisters, if they're the sisters of the Ben Gesserit ever come to that planet. It's very complicated. I feel like I'm doing a poor job of explaining it. Anyway, the Fremen have these things called Chris knives. And one of the rules is that when you draw a Chris knife, you cannot resheath it without drawing blood. But Jessica doesn't know this. The Fremen housekeeper draws a Chris knife. The Fremen housekeeper gives her Chris knife to Jessica and Jessica kind of has to guess on the fly that she needs to, to draw a little bit of she needs to kind of nick her, her skin and draw a little bit of her own blood before she can put it away. And they didn't include that in the, in the movie. Jessica resheaths the curse knife without drawing blood. And it was, it's especially weird because later out in the desert, all of the Fremen draw their Chris knives on Paul and Jessica, and they all cut their wrists before they resheathe the Chris knives. And I don't think that scene is in the book because Fremen don't draw their Chris knives willy nilly because of that ritual of, of shedding blood. You only draw it when you know you really know you're about to attack. You really are in danger because you know you're gonna have to draw blood. So that was just a weird that the rest of it I felt like was so good that it was weird that they got that one thing wrong. But yeah, as I said, on the whole, it worked for me. Paul has special powers, partly through his Ben Gesserit training, but also partly just through hereditary, through his DNA, um, because that's part of the Ben Gesserit project. And so he has these visions of the future and it's kind of like he can see alternate timelines. It's really beautifully described in the book. And in this one scene in the movie, we see some of his alternate visions of the future. And one of the things he sees is this Fremen who he ends up having to kill. In an alternate timeline, he sees that Fremen guiding him and giving him important advice. But I was realizing if you hadn't read the book and didn't know what was happening in that vision from, from the text, you might not be able to pick up on it in, in the movie. I kind of wonder, you know, if, if you read, if you watched the book without, if you watched the movie without the reading the book, if you got a little lost, if you followed it all the way, you should definitely read the book. Dune is absolutely such a fantastic world. Dune is a dark story, so it's gonna be a dark movie, but I felt like the violence could have been worse. It could have been more gratuitous, although to be fair, I'm not one for violent scenes in movies. I often kind of cover my eyes, look away, and then just look up when it's over. The music was definitely unusual. And there were times when I was watching it and I was like, is this music too much? But you know, I, I was on board with it. I overall, Overall, I have to give them credit. I thought it was a very good adaptation and I'm looking forward to seeing the next one. Since they've only covered a third of this book, who knows when they will get to sequel number six? which is what I'm on. I have two more sequels of Dune that I've never read um, and I was hoping to at least start one um, before the end of the year. So Heretics of Dune is my next one and Chapter House Dune is the last. So this takes place far into the future, way after Paul. I'll give another spoiler warning if you don't want the sequels of Dune spoiled, skip ahead. Um, but Paul's son Leto basically became a sandworm. It's kind of weird. It's sort of dictator of the universe. For 3,000 years he lived and, and some saw him in a negative light, some saw him in a positive light. He was trying to forge this golden path and like it's never exactly clear what the golden path is. Possibly it's just to make sure the human species doesn't die out. I don't know, I wasn't, I wasn't perfectly clear on the golden path thing myself. Um, so I'm kind of hoping that this takes place after the death of Leto and so presumably sort of after his golden path has been forged. So I'm wondering if there'll be a little bit more <laughs> insight into what exactly he was doing and what was happening with all of his machinations. The Ben Gesserit are still around. The book starts with them and, and another Gola of Duncan, Idaho. One of the things that Dune deals with in such a cool mystical way, it's really beautifully written and like lots of very philosophical, metaphysical digressions and discussions. But this universe is really dealing with you know, all of these crazy advances in technology and like what are the moral consequences of them? And should they be used? How should they be used? What does the effect of using them have on the human race? One of the things Porthos likes to quote from Dune is, thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of man's mind. 
back in the, the previous lore of Dune, so many, many years before like Leto and before the Golden Path, there was something called the Butlerian Jihad, where obviously there were computers and AI, I guess, maybe? It's never clear what exactly happened in the Butlerian Jihad. Um, but basically, technology had gone too far in the wrong direction, and, and there was a big, giant conflict. And even this far into the future, like even just in this first chapter where they're talking about the Gola, like they're still kind of saying, like, we've discovered how to do, how to do these <laughs> creepy things like create this goal of this guy, poor guy who, you know, but should we be, but should we really be using this technology? Anyway, I'm excited to get further into Heretics of Dune. This is 600 to 660 some pages. So I'm not sure I'll finish it before the end of the year, but we'll see how much, pro but we'll see how much progress I can make. I could give you guys a plant update, which is not much of an update because it feels like most everything has had its season and died off. This is my beautiful peace lily. This I've had um, inside for quite a long time. It was fun that it did. Um, it did flower again this year, so he'll be fine. Cymbeline did a number on this plant, but um, we'll see if that, it's, it was some kind of watermelon. It had watermelon in the name. I'm hoping this guy might be able to survive. He's put out some new leaves there. This is my impatient, which honestly has been difficult to have patience with this year. First I had it inside, it died off. I planted it outside, it seemed to be doing well, it flowered. And then I thought, you know what, let's see if we can overwinter it, dug it up. Um, Seemed to be doing well inside, but I tried to leave it outside when the temperatures were fine. And unfortunately, I left it out one night when there was a frost. And so a lot of the leaves turned black and died off. But I think it's still alive. I don't, I don't know. I'm going to have, it's a pretty big thing. So I'm going to have to figure out where to try to keep it in some sunshine this winter. This over here was my Celosia, which I bought um, when I got Cymbeline. She did a number on it, but it continued to bloom really beautifully all um, fall along. So like beginning of September, all the way through the middle of November. And like that guy looks like he's still trying, he's still trying hard, but I think it seems like it's fading. I was hoping it would be able to survive the winter inside. And like this part of it, this part of it does actually still seem alive. This part seems dead, which actually I'm surprised this survived as long as it did because Cymbeline 
uh, um, loved to pull on these branches especially. Anyway, so I don't think my celosia is going to make it much longer, but it really was beautiful this fall. This is my mango lantana, which I almost killed when I went to Disney. It got dried out, unfortunately, while I was away. However, it still seemed to be alive, so I kept watering it, and it really has put out tons of new leaves and come back very nicely, so hoping that this will be able to overwinter indoors. This is my other indoor plant in here, my calancho, um, which has not bloomed um, really. It tried to bloom a second time in the summer. I got it like back around St. Patrick's Day, um, but it still seems to be doing well. I'll have to give it some fertilizer, see what it needs to see if it can bloom again. Cause when I first bought it, it was just perfectly covered in white blossoms. It was so lovely. You may have noticed peeking out behind my plants. Here is the 2021 edition of the Bon Mama Advent Calendar. So yeah, here's some fruits rather than, <laughs> than some plants. So this has 24 types of jam to help count us down to Christmas. And the art is always so cute. Look at that. Jam jars on the tree. So I have most of the mini jam jars from my past Advent calendars. So maybe I should try to do a little jam jar tree this year. That'd be super cute. That's charming. So as you guys saw earlier in the vlog, I have some new wall art. I did unbox these in last month's reading vlog. Um, I found them. The seller is on Etsy, but she actually doesn't sell these on Etsy. At first I found a fake listing of them. Um, Beverly Aker is the artist's name and she sells them through Gallery Nucleus. I'll link it down below. But she has all of these different Lord of the Rings locations and they're just so beautiful. They almost have like a sort of Mary Blair style to them. Just love those. And yeah, I've started, started with some Christmas decorations. I sincerely doubt I'll leave that there. I'm sure it would bug me, but it looks pretty for the moment. Yes, soon you know, it'll be time to change over my calendar girl to the last dress of the year. So I've posted some uh, Pokemon card bits um, in my vlogs this year. My brothers really got back into it over the pandemic. There was a new set dedicated to Eevee and we got some of the packs and one of my brothers pulled this. It's super rare, I think. It's the Alt Art Espeon V card and look how she's in a library and all the books are flying around her. I just absolutely love that so, so much. Yeah, here's the, um, where's my Evolving Skies box? There it is. I just love Eevee. And now all of Eevee's evolutions remind me of Cymbeline. But here I have a little list that I made back in September, which turned out to be overly ambitious. I thought I would try to organize my reading for the rest of the year and it didn't go too well. I mean, it went all okay in October. I did manage to keep up, especially with my Boo to You um, reads. The only one I didn't get through was Mysteries of Udolpho. But then unfortunately in November, yeah, it just has not been a great reading month. I loved reading Letters to a Diminished Church. That was so much fun. Unfortunately, um, we had to cancel the live stream um, on Christie's channel, but I think we're hoping to still maybe do a Zoom discussion, so stay tuned. And do yourself a favor and go read Letters to a Diminished Church. It is just so beautiful. I'm so glad I, I revisited it. But yeah, Analects of Confucius, Pascal's Ponce, my other sort of nonfiction November reads. Didn't get to them. I made a little progress in Purgatorio, but I'm still not finished. Little progress in Riddle of Ingleside. Didn't even start House of Mirth. I did start Heretics of Dune, but haven't made much progress in that either. So yes, we'll see how much I can pack into December. And of course there is always 2022.
So I'm gonna wrap up my November reading vlog here. I'm trying to finish it um, a little bit early so I don't have to worry about it over Thanksgiving. It's gonna be going up the day after Thanksgiving, so I hope you all had a really wonderful holiday. It's funny, at the beginning of the month, I felt like, you know, it's still fall, still lots of beautiful leaves in the trees. I don't wanna take down my Halloween decorations. Like, I'm gonna get out in my kayak as much as I can before the end of the year. And then I feel like there was just this weird time vortex and all of a sudden it's like, Thanksgiving is practically over. I haven't gotten my Christmas things out. I need to get them out right away. Before you know it, Christmas will be over, but that's okay. We still have the whole of December before us. I am excited to decorate my new place, so I have been trying to get some things out so that I'll have it decorated at the beginning of December. I usually wait until, you know, I wait till December to decorate for Christmas. I wait till October to decorate for Halloween, which everyone does it differently, but I always want to like carry on the holiday a little bit after the holiday, so I try not to start it too early. With Christmas, especially the 12 days of Christmas are the 12 days after um, December 25th leading up to Epiphany. So I will have plenty of time to enjoy the Christmas decorations. It's been a really beautiful fall. I feel like I didn't make quite as much reading progress as I would have liked um, this fall. Hopefully December will be a better reading month. One of the things I want to get to most is my Shakespeare. Unfortunately, Cymbeline in September was the last Shakespeare play um, I finished when Cymbeline the Kitten arrived. That's why she's named Cymbeline. And I was hoping in these last three months of the year to read the three Henry VI plays, and I just have not even started Henry VI part one. But I'm gonna try to power through them. I would really like to have done 12 for 12 um, Shakespeare plays this year. And I'm so close, it seems like it'd be a pity to stop now. I've been thinking maybe I should get some of the books on my list as audiobooks because I did really enjoy, I did finally finish, I think I finished it last month and forgot to mention, The Hand of Thrawn duology, which I have been listening to the audiobook of. Um, it's recorded by Mark Reynolds, it's really good. It has lots of, you know, Star Wars sounds um, mixed in. See, I went back and watched my um, 2021 reading goals video that I posted, you know, at the end of 2020. And I was trying to fit a lot of those books into these last months, but I was realizing that when it came to Thrawn, I did really well because I had wanted to read, you know, the original Thrawn trilogy. But here I read the original Thrawn trilogy and then I listened to audiobooks of um, the duology, the Hand of Thrawn duology. So I read five Thrawn books this year. I don't know if you can hear Cymbeline. She thinks it's lunchtime. She always thinks it's lunchtime. <laughs> anyway, I really loved the way The Hand of Thrawn um, ended. It was just fantastic the way they wrapped everything up. I was making hot chocolate the other day. I'm partly inspired by Luke and Mara, the way they have um, hot chocolate at the end. is just really cute. Most of the book I would not describe as cute. Mostly it was really exciting, great adventures, uh, great characters. I loved Pelion, the way he came into the story. Just fantastic. If you're a Star Wars fan and you have not gotten around to reading the Timothy Zahn books. Definitely, definitely get to that. Anyway, if you haven't yet, give this video a thumbs up. Make sure you're subscribed. I'll talk to you guys again soon, and until then, I hope you have a magical day. Bye!